Amen. Welcome back to our um, Bible study, in which we are talking about Romans 9, Rejecting Calvinistic Predestination, Part 2. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, we, we started last week, and, um, and I want to thank those of you who are watching online, those of you who are watching on YouTube, and those of you who are here. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I didn't uh, know that there would be so much interest in in this subject but um i thank god for you and um hopefully we can clear up some things tonight now this is going to be a five-part teaching we've already did part one last week and tonight we are dealing with part two and so we got three more parts after this because romans 9 is a is is a lot to cover not because it's a complicated chapter but because people have said things about it that made it seem to be complicated. So now we have to clear up a whole bunch of junk. Glory to God. If people would just read it with the understanding that God is a good God, they wouldn't teach some of the things out of it that we have to clear up later. Praise God. Anyway, so on that note, let's go on. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so I like to start out um, these teachings with a quote by some older, somebody called, uh, accused me of, quoting obscure old um, books from the 1800s. But Calvinism was very strong in the 1800s, praise God. It, it was the orthodox teaching. And so, and some of the, and so, as I was telling Brother Larry earlier, some of the things now are so sugar-coated that even the rebuttals of Calvinism are, uh, try to be sweet and kind. But I like the way the older Calvinists, um, I mean, the older anti-Calvinists dealt with these things. Praise God. Amen. And so um, Thomas N. Ralston, in his book, Elements of Divinity or Course of Lectures, he says, Hence it is plain that the entire argument of the Calvinists for personal and unconditional election and reprobation from the epistle to the Romans is founded on a mis- application of the whole subject i fully agree we thought it only necessary to examine the passage mainly relied upon by the calvinists and the result is that we find therein no support for calvinian election and reprobation praise god so um romans chapter 9 is the main chapter relied on by calvinists and this man as well as many others, God bless you, Martha, found no support for the Calvinist position, and I will show you how right he is. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And we're going to start off with the fact that Romans 9 is not about mercy for a pre-selected few. Praise God. And, you know, some people seem to believe that in Romans 9, God is teaching that he had mercy on some and mercy and no mercy on others for arbitrary reasons and the scripture that they use of course comes from verse 15 of Romans chapter 9 it says for he said to Moses I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion now when I used to read that Romans 9 without the Calvinist interpretation I did not see that as God saying I pre-selected a few that I'm going to have mercy on praise God I pre-selected a few that I'm going to have compassion on, but but the rest of y'all, I'm not going to have compassion. It wasn't until a Calvinist brought this to my attention and said, see, God doesn't have mercy on everybody. He, does, he has pre-selected or elected those to whom he will have mercy and compassion on. And so I knew they were wrong, but at the time I didn't know how to refute it, praise God. But I do know how to do it now. But, um... The fact is, Romans 9.15, as we said, is, is said by the Calvinists to support what I believe is their false claim that God pre-selected or predestined a few individuals for mercy. And the, But to me, my understanding is, I'm going to show you, is that the Calvinists just reads into this passage of doctrine that is not supported by the totality of Scripture. It's not really even supported by this passage alone, praise God. Amen. Now, what the Calvinists always fails to remember or most Calvinists do and what people who get to see by the Calvinists fail to do 
is learn to interpret scripture with scripture. Praise God. Amen. In many, in most of Romans nine, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. Glory to God. Amen. He's not quoting the whole Old Testament because it would have been impossible for him to make his argument by reading the whole book of Exodus or the whole book of Genesis. Glory to God. Amen. So he quotes just like we do today. He quoted bits and parts. It is sad that people don't go back and look at the whole context. If you ever listen to me, whether I'm preaching on Sunday or I'm teaching a Bible study during the week, I often tell you that I can't give you the whole thing. Praise God. Amen. I often encourage you. I say, I'm going to give you this part, but you should go home and read the whole chapter. Glory to God. Amen. And that's what Paul is expecting them to do. He's expecting his audience to have to already know these books. Glory to God. Because they go to sin they went to synagogue every um every so often. And they were read these these books to them. They meant they had to memorize these things. Praise God. Yeah. So it was not it was not necessary for Paul to quote the whole scripture. But it's sad that so many Calvinists take the, uh, a small part of what Paul says and mis and, and, and misquotes it, and they don't bother to go back and read the whole thing that Paul was quoting from in the first place. Glory to God. Amen. So, but we're going to look at uh, what Paul is quoting from and show you. That um, that when you read what what the original writer, who is Moses, was saying here, or what God was saying to Moses, it has nothing to do with arbitrary selection. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, in Exodus chapter thirty-three, verses eighteen and nineteen, from which Paul is quoting from in Romans nine fifteen, it says, "And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory." And he said, I will make all my glory pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Praise God. Now, again, when you read the whole thing and you understand two words in this passage, then you will see that God is not um, teaching that or telling Moses that I, I um, elected a few for mercy and I've and I've elected a few for graciousness, but the rest of y'all are damned and going to hell. God, first, first, the thing Moses says is, Lord, show me thy glory. Praise God. Now, if you were here on Saturday, um, and I think the only two that were here on Saturday that's here today is Larry and Eunice. Um, we learned that the glory of God is the character of God. Praise God. Amen. Because after Moses said, show me thy glory. God didn't say, okay, you're going to, I'm going to walk past you and you're going to see this big bright light. That's my glory. No, God says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. What God was doing here was describing his character. Hallelujah. Amen. The, the um, glory and name are references to. To God's character, his attributes, his nature, his personality. Praise God. Amen. And so as he talked about, my goodness will pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And then God was talking about a particular aspect of his character. My character is graciousness. My character is mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. And as God I have the right to show graciousness to whom I will. And I have the right to show mercy to whom I will, and nobody has the right to tell me whether I can or cannot. Praise God. Amen. So God is God. He has the right. But you can't say, well, God, that per you know, like some people in the Pentecostal churches today. But God, he's such a sinner. He doesn't deserve any mercy. Exactly. You didn't deserve any mercy, did you? Anybody deserve mercy here? No. No. What, the, what, what is mercy? Giving you what you don't deserve. Praise God. Amen. 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 What is graciousness? Being kind to you even though you didn't earn it. Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't deserve mercy. Praise God. Amen. Now I deserved it more than some of y'all though. I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, but all God was doing here was saying, uh, this is this is my glory that I'm gonna show you. My name, my character. I am gracious. I am merciful. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, um, as we stated here, that this was the precursor to God giving 
Moses a full revelation of himself and his character. Now, when you go to um, chapter 34 and verse 5, it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed what? The name of the Lord. Say name. The name. And what does name mean? Carrier. What does name mean, y'all, besides Larry? Oh, come on, y'all. It's right up on the board. Glory to God. <laughs> How is it that you can fail open book test? <laughs> now, we go down to um, verse 6 of, of Exodus 34. It says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Look at this. What is God? Merciful. And what? And what else? And what else? God was telling you what he is. Hallelujah. Amen. How is it that Calvinists can take can miss that scripture and then take only one small thing that God said and then turn it into something that is completely opposite of the truth about God? God is saying, my, my whole character, my whole being, the person that I am, I am merciful, I'm gracious, I'm long-suffering. What does long-suffering mean? He put up with you, praise God. I mean, he puts up with a lot. I, I know when I look back on my life, I say, oh, God is long-suffering. Hallelujah. He's abundant in goodness and truth and keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. We've explained that before. We won't get into that tonight. If you want another teaching on what we call generational curse, we'll get into it, but not now. The only thing we want to see right now is that God shows that his character is one of mercy. He extends mercy for thousands, praise God. Amen. He forgives iniquity and transgression, hallelujah. Amen. This God is saying, this is who I am. This is what I am. This is what I'm all about, praise the Lord. Amen. There's nothing in here that God says that I won't show mercy to, to, to um, people that I pre-selected not to show mercy to. There's nothing in the scripture that tells us that. That has to be read into the scripture you have to be reading the scripture through a lens that adds to god's word and you know what the bible says when you when god says if you add to my word i'm going to add to you the curses praise god Amen. <laughs> and and so many people are adding to god's word now look at how moses used this revelation to god when he was praying i mean and, and um when you get to numbers chapter 14 god was mad because they i mean you know, they got to the promised land. God was ready to take them in. And, the ten, and 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, oh, yeah, God told the truth about the land. But there's giants in the land. We can't handle it. And people got mad. They started crying. They were so upset. They said, let's kill Moses. Let's kill Aaron. And let's make us a new leader and, and go back to Egypt. I don't understand, people. First, you're crying about being in Egypt. And now you want to kill Moses and Aaron and go back there. That's dumb. But anyway, but God is upset and he says, I'm going to smite them with pestilence and disinherit them. And Moses then, as I stayed here, reminded God about what he revealed concerning his character. Praise God. And Moses said, hey, God, remember what you told me? You know, you said that you are long suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. Now, why are we quoting this um, in, in conjunction with um, what God said in Exodus 34? Because if this, if that passage was the way Calvin is claiming it would be, then Moses could not pray this prayer. Praise God. Amen. Because how would he know that these people that just talk, talk, talked about killing him were predestined or not? Praise God. Amen. So if, if God only showed mercy to those he pre-selected or predestined, then Moses had no right to pray this prayer. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That would be the wrong application of, of, the, of God's revelation to him. 
But Moses shows us right here that um that God his revelation had nothing to do with a pre-selection to salvation. It had everything to do with the fact that God is merciful, kind, long-suffering. And so when God was um, ready to deal with Israel the way they deserved, Moses reminded him, God, yeah, they deserve it, but you said you're merciful. Hallelujah. Amen. So you need to apply that mercy to, to, to these, these rebels, praise God. And so what when you read the rest of um, Numbers chapter 14, God says, because... I, because of your word, Moses, I will not do what I was going to do. Praise God. Do you know that when you read the Bible and when you talk to God, you can bring God to back to his, you can bring God's word back to him. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you know that God will listen to you? Do you know that God will change the, the course on many things? Amen. Read the book of Amos sometimes. God, God showed Amos about several disasters that was going to happen. And every time God showed Amos a disaster. No, it was, was it Amos or Joel? I can't remember. I think it might have been Joel. Maybe I'm wrong. But every time God showed him a disaster and the prophet said, but God, don't let it happen. And then God said, it won't happen. Praise God. That's what I love about God. A disaster can come. God will let that disaster happen. But if you pray, God will say, oh, because of you, I won't do it. Praise God. Y'all don't know how the power you have in prayer. Glory to Jesus. And if you listen to the Calvinists, you won't even know what kind of power you got. Hallelujah. So, so now recognize Israel was a chosen nation. Praise God. But God was about to disinherit them. Now, if, if chosen or election is the way that the Calvinist claims, then God would never disinherit them because they were already elected. Praise God. But Moses um, prayed the prayer. And God didn't disinherit him. And this is the, you know, this is the same exact teaching that Paul is quoting from. And so Romans 9 cannot be teaching an arbitrary mercy that's extended only to a select few. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, God, um, God, our Lord Jesus Christ says, but love ye your enemies. And do good and lend hoping for nothing again and for and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest for look at now look at this for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And now I want you to see what God says here in verse 36 and Jesus is God. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you will see how God extends his mercy. He says, be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Praise God. Amen. Now, if I take verse 36 and apply it the way the Calvinists apply it, then I should only pre-select a few people that I'm going to have mercy on. For example, if Martha, if, if Martha, Martha does something to make me mad, I've already decided 30 years ago that I'm never going to um, extend mercy to Martha, so I will, I will ensure that Martha... Martha, sorry, Martha. I will, I will ensure that Martha gets the deserved retribution that I can extend to her. On the other hand, if uh, Diamond, I've already pre-selected that sweet little Diamond would always get mercy no matter how bad she was. Then I would, then no matter what Diamond did, I would, I would be giving her mercy, and then Martha would say, "Well, why are you being merciful to Diamond but not merciful to me?" And I will say, I am sovereign in this church. I can decide who I extend mercy to and who I don't want to. Because that's the way God is. And God told me to be merciful as he is merciful. <laughs> so if God is that way, I can be that way, right? Right? Yeah. Yes. I'm so, how about, how many of you are glad that God ain't that way? I'm telling you. So, because God's not that way, I can't be that way. I can't show favorites, praise God. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I can't be merciful to one person and not merciful to another because God's not that way. Now, as we stated here, God extends mercy to his enemies and he tells us to act just like him. So it would be wrong for you, it would be wrong for me to pre-select somebody to show mercy to, and that means it would be wrong for God to do it. Praise God. Amen. God 
extends mercy to anyone. Listen to this, baby. Anyone who meets his conditions, praise God. Amen. And anybody can meet the conditions of God to receive mercy. Now look at Psalm 86, 5. It says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all, say all, all, all them that call upon thee, praise God. Amen. All, as, as my um, pastor Paul E. Terry used to say, all means all, and that's all, all means, praise God. There is no other definition of all. You cannot say all, of, you cannot put in brackets all of the elect, praise God. There, there, you, it, that, that will be adding to the word of God. God says, all them that call upon thee, praise God. Amen. So if you call upon God, God is wanting to show you mercy. Isaiah 55, 7. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Praise God. Amen. Now, what does God tell the wicked man to do? Forsake his way. And what else? The unrighteous man his thoughts. Praise God. Yep. And, and what will God do if, if the person does that? If God if he meets his conditions? God will have mercy on him. God will abundantly pardon him. Hallelujah. So all every person obviously can forsake his way. And every unrighteous man can change his thoughts. Glory to God. That's what we were talking about earlier. Well, you know, Pastor, we sin every day. Sometimes we sin in thoughts. Well, forsake those thoughts. Glory to God. You can stop thinking a bad in a certain way. Amen. Don't tell me you can't. I know you can. I did it. Praise God. That, that, that's, that, that's right, Sister Taco. Taco Sister Taco just quoted um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. You can pull down strongholds. Praise God. You can cast down imaginations or um, wrong thoughts. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, the only person who's going to have mercy with hell from him is the one who willingly, say willingly, willingly, who willingly fails to meet God's reasonable conditions. Do you believe God's conditions are reasonable? Yep. I think they are. Praise God. I, I, I mean, God don't have to have mercy on anybody, technically speaking. Hallelujah. We all deserve hell. We all, des we all deserve to die. Praise God. But God wants to have mercy and he gives reasonable conditions. Hallelujah. People just they want mercy, but they want to keep living in sin. Praise God. I, I don't get that. You know, I, me, I wanted I wanted to stop sinning. Hallelujah. You know, God showed me this much mercy. Why well, I want to keep breaking his heart. That's like my wife saying, I love you. I forgive you. And I slap her again. I say, thank you for forgiving me, pal. Would you put up with a person like that? Yes. You would? No, just kill I'm about to say. <laughs> I, I, I'm about to get my, my hands ready. No. You don't need to Yeah, Sister Taco get me in my sleep now, y'all. If I ever hit Sister Taco, I'm going to come live with y'all, one of y'all for a while. <laughs> anyway, but God has reasonable conditions now. Uh, I mean, it's just. It's, he's not an unreasonable God. And so in Proverbs 28, 13, he says, he that covers his sin shall not prosper. Praise God. Amen. What is a what is a person covered in sin? That a person that think they can hide it from God. Like Adam and Eve did. What did they do when they sinned? Instead of saying, God, we, we messed up. They made fig leaves. But God said, if you cover your sin. You're not going to succeed. <laughs> but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you sin, what are you supposed to do? Repent. Repent. You say, God, I messed up. Don't try to make excuses. God is tired of our excuses. Glory to God. Amen. He's fed up with them. I'm telling you, every uh, people think I'm mad when I say, when I preach on certain things or say certain things. You know, I'm not really mad, but I know God is. <laughs> and, and it comes out through me. And so, it, it, as my friend Pastor Flies would say, um, I'm just a mailman. 
<laughs> he said, I'm just, matter of fact, me and Pastor Flowers were talking, and, I, and, um, and I, I told him I'm going to steal his idea. He talked about he's going to go to the costume store, get himself one of them postal ma mailman suits, and come to church and preach in one of those one day. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm stealing your idea, man. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, I'm just delivering the mail. You can't get mad at me. How many of y'all get mad at the, at the mailman when you get a bill? <laughs> no. I, well, I do, but anyway. <laughs> what are you bringing that thing for, man? <laughs> anyway, but I'm the one who made the bill, so I got to be the one to collect the, to pay it. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So the thing is, God is tired of excuses. He wants you to confess your sin, forsake your sin, turn away from it, and stop making excuses for it. Praise God. Amen. When you sin, say, God, I messed up. That's simple. Amen. And God will receive you. Hallelujah. Amen. The other thing we need to understand is that God shows no favoritism. Hallelujah. Amen. He shows mercy upon all who call on him and turn away from sin. Praise God. Amen. Now look at James chapter 3 verse 17. Um, he says, but the wisdom that is from above, say above. above. Now this is the wisdom that's from above. Above is from God. Is pure, then peaceable. Gentle and easy to be entreated, and what? What is it? It's in yellow. Uh, the first, the first yellow one. It's full of mercy. The wisdom that comes from above is full of mercy, and then good fruits and what? Now, what's the second one? See, God's mercy is without partiality. What does that mean? God does not pick and choose who's going to have mercy. Praise God. Amen. It's without partiality. It's not. It's without favoritism. Um, if we go back to the um, illustration I gave of Sister Martha and, and Sister Diamond, would you say that that was favoritism? That I showed mercy to one and not the other? Yeah, yeah. that is racism. That's 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 racism. <laughs> <laughs> But they both are the same race. <laughs> oh my! Oh, I know we're gonna have to have some teaching on racism soon. <laughs> but yes, it is. It is. Well, in a sense, it is racism. But I mean, it, it does show the um, the attitude that races have. Praise God. Favorite favoritism over one race, preference over a race over another. Praise Jesus. But. Um, God's mercy is without favoritism, without partiality, and ours should not have partiality. Praise God. Now, God wants to extend mercy. God wants to. Hallelujah. It's his desire to extend mercy. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 30, verse 18, it says, and therefore will the Lord wait. Look at this. God is waiting. That he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Praise God. Amen. Look, at God wants to have mercy. He will even wait in order to be gracious. He's waiting for you to come to him. Praise God. So he can show you mercy. Now, I like uh, a couple of other translations. The New International Reader's Version says, but the Lord wants to have mercy on you. Look at that. He will rise up to give you his tender love. The Lord is a God who is always fair. Blessed are all those who wait for him to act. Praise Jesus. Amen. Uh, the New Life Version says, So the Lord wants to show you kindness. He waits on high to have loving pity on you. For the Lord is a God of what is right and fair. And good will come to all those who hope in him. Amen. I'm telling you, do you love this God? Amen. I love this God, man. I'm telling you. Sure. And then John Wesley in his um, note says, according to the terms I myself have fixed. Uh, this is his interpretation of that scripture. Uh, I mean, of, of Romans nine. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Romans. This is um, John Wesley's understanding of Romans chapter nine, verse 15. He says, according to the terms I myself have fixed and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Amen. Namely on those who submit to my terms, who accept of it in the way that I have appointed. Praise God. Amen. That's the understanding 
of that passage. Now, we, real quickly, we're going to talk about the fact that Romans 9 is not a denial of free will. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. So Romans 9, 16, the Calvinists will read this when they will, and they believe that this is talking about your lacking mercy. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, uh, the Calvinists will tell you that this means that God will have mercy on who he wills, and if he doesn't will to have mercy on you, he won't. So that's why he preselected son to be saved and son to be lost. Do you get? Do, let me just ask an honest question. Do you do, do you read that in that scripture? Nope. I don't either. Praise God. But some I don't know how they get it. I never could understand how do you get that out of that scripture. Um, but the but I but as I've written here, the passage is not denying freedom of choice, but it's stating that God's gifts. And calling for service are not based on human effort. Praise God. In other words, you can't earn God's mercy. Why? Because it's called mercy. Praise God. Amen. If you earned it, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. Praise the Lord. Amen. If it was, it you can't earn grace because if it was, if you earned it, then it wouldn't be grace. It would be wages. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I like. Romans 9 16 in the New Life Version. It says, These good things from God are not given to someone because he wants them or works to get them. They are given because of his loving kindness. Hallelujah. Amen. I think that's the best proper way to understand Romans 9 16. And as I wrote here, the passage is not denying freedom of choice, but it's simply stating that God's gifts and callings for service is not based on human effort. Praise God. Now, the problem with Israel was that and when you read the chapter, you will see that Israel thought that they earned the right to God's covenant blessings. Hallelujah. Amen. And Paul was showing them that it has nothing to do with your heritage. It has nothing to do with you being a Jew. And you can't. And how dare you question God because he extended his mercy to the Gentiles and has left you behind. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, you know, they deceived themselves into believing that God was indebted to them. And so that's what Paul, what Paul was dealing with in this passage. He wasn't talking about an arbitrary election. And when you go down to verses 30 through 32 of, the, of Romans 9, that's exactly what he's saying here. Um, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have obtained the righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. See, the Gentiles didn't think that I got to earn anything. They just simply believed God. Hallelujah. Amen. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. What is Paul saying here? They tried to work for it. Praise God. Amen. God doesn't give stuff based on your work he gives it based on your his mercy hallelujah Amen. when you try to earn things from god that's what legalists do legalists try to earn things from god they they they're, they're people who try to live holy to earn things from god are all are usually the mean kind ain't they <laughs> ain't they ain't legalists the legalists are so mean because they they think i've earned my right to be, to be with god you a sinner you don't do you don't do as much as i do in the church so you're not going to get all the blessings I got. You know, it used to frustrate me when I see, after all the years I've been with the Lord and working in the church, how God would bless some people more than me. And they weren't even doing as much as I was doing. And, and God had to remind me, don't be a legalist. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. He said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So I, start, I learned to start just uh, start looking at what I was doing and start believing God for mercy. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Like a man of God once said when they when he was um part of the assemblies of God. <laughs> uh, take him outside, Larry. All right. all right, praise God. He'll be all right. The good thing about babies like that is they got soft malleable heads. <laughs> praise God. All right. Now, as we were saying, God's mercy is dependent on faith. Praise the Lord. It's not dependent on you earning anything. It's just like I was saying. Some I had to learn. It's not based on what I do. It's based on what God does. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then God even tells them in Romans chapter 11 verse 23. If if they stop 
about living in unbelief, they will be grafted in again. Hallelujah. So again, it can't be God talking about God selected this person but didn't select that person. It's saying that people don't believe, they don't get. Hallelujah. And this is illustrated in Romans chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. We won't read that scripture. I recommend that if you're interested in the subject, read it at home or um, watch the video. I'm going to try to put it up online tomorrow and just pause that part. Praise God. All right. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, same thing. It has nothing to do with works. It has everything to do with God's grace. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So the only way to enter into God's plan is by faith in his mercy. And that's a condition that anybody can meet. Praise God. This is where Israel failed and where the Gentiles succeeded. Glory to God. All right. In conclusion to this part, we see that when we interpret scripture with scripture, then we come to a different understanding of Romans 9 than that which is espoused by Calvinistic predestinarians. Praise God. So at, at hopefully you are seeing that there is no Calvinism in Romans chapter 9. Glory to God. There is no predestination to salvation, no predestination to the blessings or curses in Romans chapter 9. All of that is a demonstration when you read the context and you read the, um, the passages that Paul is quoting from, you understand that God is simply talking about his mercy being extended to the Gentiles and why the Jews were being rejected. But then he says, he says in Romans chapter 11 that if they stop um, abiding in unbelief if they would start believing him again then he would bring them back in praise God that's mercy that's a merciful God hallelujah all he says is that if you meet my conditions I'll take care of you you don't meet my conditions then I can't take care of you praise God because you're rejecting me it's not a matter of God rejecting them it's a matter of them rejecting God glory to God amen so um we want to just say, those of you who are watching, if you have been blessed by this video, won't you please um, put a like in the video? Um, uh, I think I've got the wrong finger. Put a like somewhere down there in the video and also put a comment letting us know how God has blessed you through this. And, um, and over here, there's a subscribe button. So if you did not, if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please do so. We are going to continue to put more um, videos and teachings of this nature out there to bless you and keep you encouraged and help you to learn how good our God is, how wonderful he is, and the truth about God's character um, against those who teach a, um, an ugly picture of God that cannot be found in the scriptures. Praise God. Amen? Amen. God's people said? Amen. Come on, God's people said? Amen.